Hello, everyone. My name is Tal August. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Washington, and I'm here to present uh, some work that I did with my advisor, Katerina Renecki, on how using more formal language and online experiments can lead to your participants paying more attention to that experiment. So first of all, what is online experimentation? Now traditionally, if you're a researcher and you wanted to run a study with human subjects, you, could, you would recruit participants, sit them down in your lab, and have them take your study in person. Online experimentation is where instead researchers have participants take studies online instead of in person. Now this has been gaining a lot of popularity recently since researchers are able to collect many more participants much more quickly and much more cheaply than traditional in-lab studies. If you think about it, sending a survey or an online study out to thousands of people at once is a lot, more, is a lot easier than getting a thousand people to come into your lab. Now there are two flavors of online experimentation, paid and volunteer. So paid experiments is as you would expect, you pay participants a small amount of money to take your study. A common platform where researchers run paid online studies is Amazon Mechanical Turk. Volunteer online experiments instead incentivize participation by drawing on participants' intrinsic motivations for taking a study, such as their desire to support science or to learn something new about themselves. And a, usually these experiments will also offer some sort of performance feedback or comparison to others at the end of the study uh, to further incentivize it. So a constant goal and struggle of online experimentation is obtaining high data quality. Since recruiting participants online allows you a lot less control over the environment in which participants will take your study. You don't know if there's screaming children in the background, if they have multiple tabs open, um, if they get bored, it's a lot easier for them to get up and leave. So ensuring that participants stay engaged throughout your study is difficult. So for example, there's very little you can do as a researcher about participants dropping out of your study if they decide it's not really interesting or something distracts them, not paying attention during your study, so if they have multiple tabs open, uh, they might switch between many of them and come back to your study at various points, having forgotten what they inputted before, or just not taking your study seriously. Maybe they were bored, they started it, um, and then they started giving fake answers. And it's hard, since you don't see these participants, they're not in the lab with you, to tell what exactly they're doing. Now, all these issues with participant engagement can damage the reliability of the data you're collecting. One way that studies can improve their data quality is paying attention to the wording of their questions and instructions. So clear instructions with examples and questions that avoid framing or leading participants on are important considerations for collecting reliable data. For example, asking participants if you would allow a hate group to hold a rally given the importance of free speech leads to almost twice as many participants saying yes to this hate group compared to would you allow a hate group to hold a rally given the risk of violence? Now take a moment to notice the structure and connotation of these two questions and how they could sway how you responded um, based on them. Even though they're asking the exact same thing, they heavily influence how participants will respond. Now, while past work has mostly looked at question wording in terms of framing and biased questions, so looking back on that previous example, it's pretty clear if you think about it for just a moment uh, how these two questions, although they are asking the same thing, uh, lead participants on in wildly different ways. And as a researcher, it's clear how to uh, not do that or at least not put those biased framings in. But there are other dimensions of language style that are much more nuanced that also influence user behavior, such as language formality. So formality can convey power hierarchies and social distances, and often is related to other dimensions of language, like politeness. Now, formality can affect user behavior in a number of online domains, such as online communities and crowdfunding. For example, Wikipedia editors, who are more likely to be elected as administrators, use more polite language before being elected, suggesting that using formal language or using polite language is a way of gaining social capital, at least in the Wikipedia context. In crowdfunding campaigns, using more thankful language and referring to authority, which are also characteristics of formal language, are more likely to be funded. Now, considering the impact formal language can have on user behavior in these online domains, 
We were curious if formality affected participant engagement in online studies, whether participants read instructional text, completed studies, and exerted themselves throughout the study. So to answer these questions, we developed an online study based on a common problem-solving task. This is how we advertise the study to participants. Uh, this was advertised on both a volunteer and paid online experimentation platform, which I'll get to in a moment. The experiment presented participants with increasingly difficult problems from easy to difficult, with a total of 30 questions. So here's an example of one of the easy questions. Uh, participants in this question had to select one out of five, one of those bottom uh, five images that match the image above. So in this case, I'm sure you're all wondering, it's number one is the correct answer to match this image. Uh, for the difficult questions, this is an example of a difficult one instead. Uh, and as you can see, it's a lot harder to figure out which one is the correct answer. And I won't make you think about it right now. But at the end of the study, we then gave them their score, uh, which was a score out of 30, and compared them to how past participants, like the score of past participants as well. Now, in the study, participants were presented with one of two versions of instructional text, informal and formal. In the informal version, we used less pleases, used more contractions, like there'll be, and added a healthy dose of emojis, smiley emojis, sad emojis, things like that. In the informal, or sorry, in the formal version, we used many more pleases, we expanded all of our contractions, and we used more traditional punctuation, like mostly periods. And in the informal version, we also used many more exclamation points. Now, these two formality versions were based on prior work identifying common rewrites between formal and informal text, and we validated this forma formality manipulation by having participants rate the formality of sentences drawn from both versions of the text during the study. And this was on a scale from one to seven. Now, one thing to note is that we did not aim to develop language that existed on the extremes of this informal, formal scale, since incredibly informal language, as you might guess, includes things like swear words and misspellings, which are completely inappropriate for an online study. So instead, our goal was to represent formality styles that realistically occur in an online setting and specifically in online studies. And our validation actually supported this goal as the two formality versions were both rated near the middle of the informal formal scale. However, the formal version of the instructions were rated significantly higher than the informal instructions. So although, although they were both not extremely informal or extremely formal, uh, there was a significant and perceptible difference between the two based on our manipulation. We then measured participant engagement across four different measures. Attention, which we measured as a binary variable based on if participants clicked on the final word in the break screen after the practice round. So this was a traditional um, instructional manipulation check, also called an attention check. Dropout, which we measured as a binary variable also based on if participants completed the study or not. Time to complete the study and a participant score on the study itself. So again, uh, this was a score out of 30 since there were 30 questions on the uh, study. And although problem solving ability does naturally vary between individuals, so it would be expected that different participants would get different scores, uh, measuring score could capture whether participants gave up on the more difficult questions, so providing a useful proxy for effort. If you think back to that easy question versus that hard question, the hard question, if you spend enough time on it, you will eventually get it, but uh, measuring score allowed us to measure how well participants like, exerted effort on the experiment as well. Now we compared all four of these measures between participants in each of the two formality versions, controlling for demographics like age and gender. We were also curious if any effect of formality held for different incentive types. So we ran the study on both a volunteer-based volunteer -based platform called Lab in the Wild and a paid platform, Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we had participants that were both incentivized through uh, money as well as through intrinsic motivations. So there were no significant differences between percent or in percent dropout, time, and score on the test between the formal and the informal conditions. However, participants in the formal conditions were significantly more likely to pass the attention check than participants in the informal condition. So for experiments where reading the instructions are important, using more formal language helps in this case. 
Now, the formal condition improved Lab in the Wild and Mechanical Turk participants' chances of passing the attention check. So for both paid and volunteer participants, uh, formal instructions helped them pass this attention check by roughly 10%. So formal language is associated with higher stakes environments like talking to many people or to a superior. So this could lead to participants paying closer attention to the instructions when the study used more formal language. Now, as you can see from the graph, uh, the Mechanical Turk participants also were just more likely to pass the attention check in general. Uh, But you see for both informal and formal, uh, there's a increased slope of around 10% for Lab in the Wild and Mechanical Turk. And then for going for, uh, on the topic of the Mechanical Turk participants, um, we attribute the reason that they pass the attention check more often than Lab in the Wild participants uh, to be based on the fact that paid crowd workers often have to deal with identifying and passing attention checks. And there's a lot of prior work showing that this actually may help train them to identify and pass them better. And considering for our Mechanical Turk participants, we only used uh, participants who had a 99% approval rating or higher, these probably were the ones that got really good at identifying and passing these attention checks. Now, this is also supported by the fact that we found that Lab in the Wild participants actually scored higher on average than Mechanical Turk participants, suggesting that although they weren't necessarily passing the attention check, they were uh, investing effort into the study as well. Okay, so what are the takeaways from this? First of all, For experiments where reading the instructions are important, such as if you have to have them expand the screen fully, or if the study has complicated instructions, using more formal language helps. Um, Participants are more likely to pay attention and read instructional text fully. It's also important to note that formal language did not harm any measures of engagement. So if you're on the fence about either using formal language or using informal language, we found that using formal language did not harm any measures of, measures of engagement, but did help in the, in the, forgetting the word, um, did help with participants paying attention. So then if you're faced with an online experiment that you want to redesign the language of from less formal to more formal, doing things like expanding contractions, removing emojis, Uh, and using please are all ways that you can improve or increase the perceived formality of instructional text text based on uh, what we found with perceived formality. So that is it. Um, If you have any questions now, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Tal. We've got time for a few questions, and I'm just going to point out where the microphones are. So we've already got somebody lined up at the microphone over there, and we've also got a roaming microphone and um, a a microphone there as well. Okay. Uh, Hi. um, I'm Bjorn. I'm a researcher at Uber. This is really cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, It's really interesting that you see improved attention, but you don't necessarily see improvements on things you'd expect attention to lead to, which is like completion rates, uh, score on the test, and like um, time. So I guess I'm kind of curious. I, I think it sounds like you're saying for tasks that where attention is important to use this. Um, do you have any plans to sort of like try to measure like benefits of that improved attention on the task itself? Yes, that's a great question. So one of the things that we made sure to look at, um, which I didn't present here, but we did want to make sure that uh, where we put the attention check did at least matter a little bit. Um, since, again, although we always want participants to read all instructions, whether or not like that's super important for them understanding the task is kind of up in the air. Like, for example, in this case, I was able to explain what you're supposed to do on the test or on the study in, like, a couple seconds. So uh, we did see that participants in general that passed the attention check did score higher and complete the study more. So there does seem to be some signal with attention, although that didn't translate all the way through to formality. Uh, It would be interesting and something that I would want to do in the future is uh, embed attention checks in maybe more important instructions or in a task, again, that has much more complicated instructions and see if you see a stronger uh, signal from attention. That'd be be a cool effect to see. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Hi, uh, James Simpson, University of York. Uh, Interesting study. Uh, One question I have, though. uh, Did you look at what effect uh, varying the number of tasks participant had had on those uh, uh, on on the uh, study on the results you found for the study? For instance, did fewer tasks increase the formality, uh, or sorry, increase the um, 
increase the attention um, between the two conditions, or would more tasks, like I guess my, que- I guess my question is really, how does varying sort of the number of tasks uh, impact those, the scores? Yeah, so we did not vary uh, the number of tasks in this experiment, so it was the same experiment for both formality conditions, and that was like the main um, manipulation that we had. Although, based on the results that we found, so for something like dropout at least, uh, when I was looking at it, you would imagine to see that dropout would kind of increase as uh, tasks increased, but we actually found most of the dropout was very early on anyway, and by the time people got to the attention check, for example, they were pretty likely to finish the study. And so, in general, we didn't see a lot of difference uh, or any signifiers that there would be a huge amount of difference with increasing the tasks. Uh, although maybe putting the attention check later on would have been an interesting thing to try too. We put it right after the practice round, so that was only two of the questions, and then there were another 30 after that. It's possible that people would have passed the attention check at a lower rate um, had you put it later on in the study too. Yeah, interesting question. But we've got plenty of time for questions, so if there are any questions from uh, up here and you can't get to one of the microphones, raise your hand. We've got a student volunteer who's roaming with a roaming microphone. Um, I wanted to ask about if you could say a bit more about what sort of scenarios, uh, if there are any scenarios in which um, informal instructions might be preferred or... Um, uh, uh, you know, it might be the, the best case. So tell you, not necessarily looking at the engagement, but, but looking at other aspects of the study, so who you're targeting and so on. Um, I'm curious about this because a lot of the work that I do is it, it's, um, the instructions are often um, uh, constrained by the requirements of the ethics board yeah. in the institution, yeah. and often that requires a lot of formality. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, can you say a bit about why you would want informal language? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So in this study, we didn't, we didn't find any, any cases where informal language was helpful, but I think one area that this definitely uh, would be exciting to expand into is covering different cultures and looking at different contexts where uh, the participants taking the study may have a different perception of formality I mean, may, may react differently to it. So, like, for example, we now have translated the study into uh, Russian and Mandarin as well to see if in maybe other languages uh, formality may matter more or less. And so in those cases, we may see that informal language works better, um, which is totally possible. And um, we'll just have to wait for the next uh, round of data analysis for that too. But absolutely, I think that not every case would um, formal versus informal. Would you always want to do formal? Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my name is Andy War from Uber. Uh, there was a, another session um, previously in the conference that was looking at uh, formal and what they called uh, casual language between uh, web surveys and chatbots, and they noticed an interesting difference for uh, higher performance in data quality, so avoiding uh, straight lining, for example, yeah. um, when uh, using a casual language in a chatbot. Huh. Uh, so. Two questions, really. One, um, sorry if I missed this, did you look at data quality of uh, survey completion between informal and formal? Mm -hmm. And then two, uh, does any of your future work planning on looking at uh, different modalities for uh, administering surveys? Yeah, absolutely. So we did look at uh, survey completion in this case. We didn't see a significant difference between formal and informal uh, for that. But that's interesting. I am curious, it would be interesting to see how the different contexts, and I think this is actually a great example of how the different contexts influence where formal versus informal language is actually beneficial. So I could see for something like a chatbot where formal may feel stilted um, or constrained, how people wouldn't necessarily engage with uh, the chatbot as well. Whereas for something like an online survey where you know, we're putting up a consent form in the beginning, there's much more like a heavier emphasis on science and like you should trust us, we're researchers and we're scientists. Um, it could be that in this case, using less formal language signified like less seriousness uh, to the participants. So yeah, I guess kind of going back uh, to Jenny's question on where informal might be a better take, maybe it, in the case of chatbots um, and in more social interactions, that's a better style to go with. So. Please, please join me in thanking our speaker, Tal. Thank you.